Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, Nokia Private Wire uh, Network and man uh, for Manufacturing and Logistics uh, webinar. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, um, obviously 5G is it will play an important part of the uh, the region's future. We've seen within the LEP that digital and advanced manufacturing are uh, two of the four key areas of strategic importance. And the SEP also sets out the strategic economic plan, sets out the region's ambition to become a hub for development around 5G technologies. And within the NEAA, part of our vision is that we'll have uh, strengths in uh, research, development and innovation in new automotive technologies and also manufacturing processes. So even before COVID, we've seen digital technologies as a huge opportunity for the automotive sector. Um, SMMT produced a report a couple of years ago now, but that highlighted if we were to fully adopt digital technologies within the automotive sector, there'd be a 74 billion benefit to the UK economy by 2035. Um, more recently, we've got Made Smarter, which sets out the, uh, the UK's digital manufacturing strategy to try and uh, realise a 30% in, uh, increase in productivity by 2035. And there's two key initiatives um, under the Made Smarter programme. Manufacturing Made Smarter, which is about 147 million Industri industrial Strategy Challenge Fund um, program, which will look at smart factories, connected and intelligent supply chains, adaptable, flexible manufacturing and skills and design make test. And then a second program around uh, Made Smarter Adoption, which is targeting the, uh, the SME community and trying to support those SMEs to help capitalize on digital opportunities. Within the region, as I said, we've, um, we do have 5G ambition and we ourselves have been working with um, partners, Sunderland City Council, Nissan, Vantech, Newcastle Uni, uh, University and a few others around a, a funding bid for 5G enabled connected autonomous uh, logistics. Sunderland City Council also have ambitions to, to put 5G into the city centre and it's through the work with Sunderland uh, City Council on their 5G ambitions and then also the 5G Create that I got engaged with Nokia. And a few, a few weeks ago, they presented this um, presentation to me, highlighting the, uh, the private wireless network um, and also the industrial digitalization uh, work they've been doing in their Olu factory. Um, which in two years has seen a significant product, productivity increase of around 50%. So it's quite a fundamental opportunity for the Northeast. And I really do believe that their 5G private uh, wireless is, is, is a game changing uh, technology. So, with that in mind, just in terms of housekeeping, I'd just like to ask you to keep your mics on mute so we don't get any background in, um, interference. As we go through the presentation, if you do have any questions, please put them into the chat. The chat will remain anonymous, so you can feel free to put your, your questions in there. They'll just go through to, um, to the host. And then we'll run a question and answer session at the end of the, uh, the presentations. Uh, if we do have any unanswered questions, then obviously we will work with Nokia uh, to get those questions answered and then we'll feed them back uh, to everyone um, post-event. So I'll now hand over to uh, Rebecca, who's going to take us through the agenda. Thank you. Have it. Thank you, Paul, very much. Um, so good morning everyone, thank you for joining. Um, my name is Rebecca Phillips, I work within the Nokia Enterprise team um, and support the sales for manufacturing logistics for UK and Ireland and I'll also be the moderator for today's webinar. Just to give you a quick running order of what's going on today, so I'll just give you a very brief introduction into Nokia Enterprise. I will then hand over to my colleague Thomas and he will discuss the challenges, drivers and use cases. Um, he will then pass over to Simon. Uh, he will discuss the private wireless and the emerging Ofcom spectrum availability and the uh, benefits this has on the UK industry. Simon will finally pass over to me and as Paul mentioned uh, earlier, we'll try and answer as many questions as we can in the Q&A and if not, we'll follow them up afterwards. So just to jump straight into it, as you probably already aware, Nokia is a global organisation. Uh, we have around about 100,000 people that work 
work within Nokia and we turn over around about 23 and a half billion each year. Um, most people still think that we make mobile phones. Um, I love my Nokia 3310. Um, but actually most of our business now is delivering carrier grade networks to the likes of um, BT, Vodafone, EE, and that's for fibre, mobile networks, IP. Um, and also we build the software that brings all of that together. So around about three years ago, we recognised that enterprises have a real need um, for carrier grade technology. So within that, um, Nokia has four segments. So the first one is transport. Um, so working with High Rise England, Network Rail, also ports like Port of Hamburg. Um, the second segment is public sector. So within that, that's smart cities, um, central government, emergency services. Third one is energy and utilities. So we're looking at um, smart grid and IoT within that. And then the final segment is why we're all here today, manufacturing and logistics. So we'll discuss that today. Um, as we are manufacturers ourselves, we actually use some of the technology that we are going to be discussing today. Um, and the reason why is that we drive some of the benefits ourselves, um, such as productivity gain, security, health and safety. Um, and also we've had this opportunity that's been presented for manufacturing in the UK, which is that of the beginning of the year Ofcom release spectrum, um, which enables us now to use 4G and 5G without the use of uh, mobile network operators. So for yourselves, that means you'll have a secure, reliable, resilient, low latency, high bandwidth network um, for your business. And what we'll do to understand what all that means, I'll hand over to Thomas and he'll take you from here. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Rebecca, and also a very warm welcome from my side. So I'm Thomas Heinzel, I'm uh, leading the manufacturing and logistics vertical uh, for Europe, Middle East and Africa in uh, Nokia Enterprise. And uh, as Rebecca mentioned, I would like now to, let's say, introduce you into the challenges, the use cases, but also the business benefits uh, and some experience that Nokia has already made in the manufacturing and, and of course, also the automotive domain. Um, so if we start with uh, the, the challenges and the business drivers manufacturing enterprises face today, um, uh, let, me, let me just pick one or two examples here to outline uh, the, what leads here to innovation and your requirements. So I think one of the most obvious challenges uh, that we currently face um, is the combination of efficiency and productivity um, along the production or value chain process that we see in manufacturing uh, combined with the, with the flexibility and agility that is required today. Um, if you think about, uh, uh, let's say, production towards lot size one manufacturing uh, and complete customization, I think that is one of the challenges that we at the moment see uh, in the manufacturing space. Um, a second challenge uh, is circling around the topic of sustainability uh, and green production, of, of course. Um, this includes, on the one hand, the very obvious carbon emission and energy consumption risk reductions that we are targeting for in the manufacturing space, but it is also related to, for example, uh, workers' health and safety, uh, which becomes more and more important, especially if we talk about heavy industries. Um, and finally, let me just take a third example. Uh, if we take the interaction with the surrounding ecosystem, uh, meaning that we interact with suppliers, with vendors, with partners, but also with customers, I think this is key today if we think about just-in-time production, if we think about real-time uh, process adaptions, um, as well as when we want to optimize our overall business output. So if we look now on the right side of the slide, um, the, um, uh, the challenges that lead to innovation and new requirements if we do the next click uh, in organizations and processes and of course also in technology. Um, again, I mean we identified here a very strong need for bringing automation uh, to the shop floor and increasing existing automation that is there. And I think the automotive industry is one of the leading ones and their supplier network is one of the very, one, very advanced industries uh, where we see this already happening these days. Uh, we see that more than 90% of data that is available on the shop floors today um, isn't used or isn't properly processed uh, today. So there is need for more data transparency and for more data processing. Um, and finally, we also see that classical planning somehow gets replaced with real-time planning and with changeability uh, to really react uh, uh, towards the fast-changing environments and circumstances in manufacturing. Um, so with all these uh, changes uh, uh, in mind and what they share in common, of course, is, is a need for reliable connectivity 
uh, for something like secure data transmission and of course also uh, for performant data exchange. Um, so let's, let's have a look onto the use cases that help here to let's say address those challenges. And when we discuss about manufacturing use cases, um, you might have already come across, let's say, different kind of definitions. We see uh, more business related definitions, we see more technology related definitions, but also solution or product related definitions. So what we have tried here um, at Nokia, and this is what I want to outline on this slide, is to structure the use cases uh, technology and solution agnostic and really stay with the business benefits that I will talk about in a minute on the next slide. Um, so let's get started um, with those four categories that you will see here on the slide. Um, so category number A is here the digital factory campus and this is basically uh, covering use cases related to the campus as such. You might here think about indoor or outdoor use cases uh, that cover topic around digitalization, around connectivity for the campus, as well as sustainability or environmental improvement. And I come to the detail in a second. Um, the second layer here uh, in green is the automated shop floor. So one level deeper, when we discuss about the plants, about the production lanes, uh, we see a strong momentum around uh, automation, around machine communication, um, and also around monitoring, optimizing, and simulating production processes in many different flavors. Um, the third one here is the connected worker, um, which is, I would say, one of the two, let me call it, resources that are working, of course, on the shop floor. And we see a lot of use cases related to worker augmentation, to remote support, and to human-machine interaction, so between humans and machines. Uh, and the last one here is the smart asset. So uh, you can consider anything like machines, like robots, like vehicles, or even pallets or metal cages as smart assets. Um, and use cases there include basically monitoring, tracking, controlling, and uh, handling these, these kind of assets. Um, so based on that scheme, uh, let me now use uh, the next slide to uh, illustrate uh, the, the business benefits and especially how the private wireless um, that Rebecca already mentioned during the introduction uh, plays a role here. So starting again with the digital factory, um, we see use cases like connected cameras, like security and surveillance, or environmental sensing here. Um, imagine um, that, you, that you can combine, for example, data from inside your factory, like uh, sensing humidity, hum uh, temperature, or light, um, with something like a video signal that is coming uh, from outside your factory. Yeah? Uh, and with that, you can basically create uh, something like a 360 degree security view of your plant. Um, and this is, I would say, one of the one of the main business benefits that you see here uh, with the digital factory campus. Yeah. Um, also, if you think about, let's say, uh, the next level of uh, the next level of flexibility and efficiency uh, when it comes to the manufacturing space. Um, I mean, uh, looking back into into what history brought to us, meaning in automation technologies, there is a big boost, especially when we talk about uh, private wireless technologies. Um, uh, and there are some significant improvements that we that we see here. So um, let me maybe outline uh, uh, one point um, for this uh, for the private wireless um, domain here. So looking into the private wireless capabilities, it is mainly I would say the network uh, coverage for the whole campus and for the plant that is required. So imagine that you replace cables with reliable, uh, with a secure and with a performant wireless connectivity. Yeah. Um, that should give you the, the required mobility for drones, for mobile cameras, as mentioned, but also should serve you with a proper bandwidth and data throughput uh, to serve, for example, multiple video signals across uh, your whole campus with those, with those use cases. Let's move on to the automated shop floor. Um, use cases here maintainly cover, uh, mainly cover automation aspects uh, between machines, uh, but also between machines and humans. We talk here about cloud robotics. We talk here about uh, quality management using, for example, video streaming or video analytics. So a lot of use cases related to this topic. Um, and the business drivers here um, are, are quite clear. Uh, on the one hand, it is automation, uh, which is maybe the most obvious one. Um, however, we see some significant improvements coming with private wireless networks. Um, and I think a second uh, aspect to mention here is the flexible shop floor design. So if you think about, for example, integrating a video stream into your quality management process, yeah, integrating a wireless video camera uh, that monitors the product across the shop floor, 
um, or the, the process as such. You can, of course, automatically detect, for example, damaged products um, or some, some missing holes if you drill some kind of electronics parts. So there are, there are many aspects coming from this, uh, from this quality management uh, domain. Another business driver we see here is uh, the safety and the safety proof manufacturing. Uh, so going back to the past where you always need these kind of safety cages uh, to, uh, to allow humans and robots working next to each other, we now see private wireless technologies helping to avoid those investments um, because they are, they are safety proof and there are capabilities and technologies that come with private wireless uh, that enable, uh, let's say, the collaborative uh, working of robots and machines um, on the shop floor. We can implement things like wireless emergency uh, stop buttons, like that manhandles through wireless technologies. Um, and that, of course, uh, in the end helps a lot. And we see, uh, maybe the last point to mention here, um, we see the production flexibility and customization playing a very important role or is a very important business driver and business benefit here. Uh, so let's take, for example, the automotive industry where, of course, lot size one production is already day-to-day -day business uh, and where we see each and every car that is ordered, configured and produced uh, based on the customer requirements. Uh, and if we combine that with the flexibility needed uh, to, let's say, shift and, and, and shuffle the shop floor activities, uh, then it is exactly uh, what you need when it comes to private wireless because then you can combine the existing ICT and OT technologies uh, together. And I think this is also here the most important uh, benefit from private wireless networks that you can combine those technologies um, that, you can, um, that you can target for low latency capabilities and real-time communication on the shop floor um, and that you basically have your production and your product data safe and stored inside your local campus network, which provides you an additional security layer. So let's move on to the next one. Um, when we talk about the connected worker on the next slide. Um, so the connected worker um, covers use cases such as augmentation, but also tablets or smart glasses that are connecting uh, a remote expert with the worker on site. You might even add voice or video communication here as a use case and complement it with uh, connected variables like helmets or garments or personal safety equipment. Um, so one of the main business benefits here is of course the health and safety of the worker. So imagine that we have um, some uh, smart glasses uh, where the work orders are shown, where the worker on site gets some interactive guides um, and uh, where, of course, all this comes with hands-free operation. Um, so you might even think also about monitoring the worker, uh, meaning that high temperatures, gas exposure, noise exposure, or even the fall of a worker is monitored and so health and safety is ensured uh, with something like connected variables. And that, of course, comes, comes as a business benefit. Another driver, uh, for example, would be the subject matter expert and the remote connection, as already mentioned. So you can significantly, of course, reduce your travel costs, your outage times, and also your support quality if you have your subject matter experts um, remotely and they do not need to travel to a particular factory or plant uh, and can simply help the worker on site from their remote location. Yeah? And in the end, uh, through that process, you also, let's say, document properly what has been done and you might even reduce the point of failures and the maintenance or repair tasks uh, that are needed because you're simply handling the machine right with the remote expert um, helping the guy helping the guy on site. And again, we see a couple, if not all, of the private wireless connectivities on the right side. Uh, of course, um, I would like to outline here that it really depends on the use case um, that you want to implement in your factory. So if we, for example, talk about video and augmented or virtual reality content, then it is maybe more about data throughput. If we talk about uh, human machine interfaces, uh, it might be uh, reliability or latency that is needed from the system. And if we talk about variables, it might be uh, the, co the, the mobility because the workers are moving around. So we are really designing here the network based on the use case uh, that you in the end um, uh, want to implement. And let's move to the last category of the use cases. Um, so uh, here we go with the smart assets and this uh, category covers the typical, I would say, IoT use cases or buzzwords like condition monitoring or predictive maintenance for any kind of machine or asset. And also if we think about autonomous guided vehicles, which are, I would say, a very common and, and, and uh, quite frequently seen use case in the logistics domain, for example, we see that also in this, in this category. 
Um, let's take an example, for example, to explore the, the business benefits in this category. So if we have, for example, a special robot that is mounted on some kind of a trolley inside a factory, uh, and that, of course, is a scarce resource, and we want to optimize uh, the utilization, uh, you can simply implement technologies that you know where the robot is at the moment, uh, and when and where it will be used. Um, uh, based on that, you can schedule maintenance tasks in non-busy times and, of course, also manage spare parts of that uh, robot quite wisely. Um, and you can even go as far to track misuse or something like movements outside the working hours or outside the perimeter of the campus. So you can even um, uh, put the aspects of security and the inventory perspective here to optimize that uh, by having a connected smart asset. Um, thinking more about the operational part, um, the robot, of course, um, uh, helps to, to keep the shop floor design flexible without increasing the numbers of those expensive robots. Um, and of course, you might also connect them to a centralized machine execution system uh, to reduce, let's say, uh, manual operational costs on the shop floor uh, for the guided vehicles and for the robots. All right, so let me sum up the use cases um, here with one example from the logistics on the next slide, um, where I would say multiple use cases and solutions have been put together uh, to establish something like an intelligence and did a digitalized automated uh, supply chain. So the first box, the first blue box here um, is of course the logistics uh, journey that starts in a, in a factory, in a warehouse of the supplier. And we can see here a very strong focus on the warehouse automation in the beginning. Yeah? Um, and this is true for short haul as well as for long haul transit and uh, distribution hubs, for example. So remembering again the list of use cases we have just discussed, yeah, we see a couple of them appearing here, um, like for example, automated guided vehicles that are shipping things from A to B inside um, the, the warehouse or inside the factory, which would then be the intra-logistics part. Uh, we see tablets or human machine interfaces um, for worker interaction that are connected to a, to a private wireless network. We see voice and video communication here between the, the staff members and the different um, folks on the field or in the, in the hub. And of course, we also see some sensors um, across the campus that are connected um, uh, to provide additional data. Um, the second block we see here, uh, let's, let's now move from, let's say, starting the logistics chain and starting the automation towards optimization. So moving a bit forward in the supply chain, um, we experience a shift um, towards analyzing, um, uh, optimizing, predicting hubs and warehouses. And this is where then advanced analytics, for example, come into play. Um, so we see a massive amount of data, as mentioned in the introduction, that is not used today. Um, and that we want to use across the various logistics system to, pre to predict workload, to uh, simulate process flows, but also to do the staffing and resource planning. So this is exactly what happens when we talk about hub, op hub optimization here. And you can even go as far to, for example, think about video analytics um, that are again monitoring the different processes, monitoring uh, the packages, or for example, even the truck and trucks and the traffic that uh, comes across the campus uh, to optimize that one as well and to avoid any kind of traffic jam. And the last box here, um, finally, let's say we move into the distribution centers um, and into the, uh, or we move, sorry to say, we move uh, beyond the distribution centers and the logistics hubs. Uh, and we talk about global asset tracking, um, where, whenever these goods are somehow in transit. So we see that positioning technologies um, play an important role here, of course, inside uh, the warehouse, but also with global kind of GPS-based positioning and tracking outside the hub uh, to, on the one hand, monitor the position, but also monitor the condition um, of assets. And especially this is important if we talk about assets that are of high value or that are mission critical uh, across the delivery chain for something like just-in-time delivery, for example. Um, so let's now move uh, to the last part of my presentation um, to show you some examples and some experience from Nokia um, that we did. Um, and uh, Paul already outlined one example that I will come to in a minute uh, during the introduction. So let me start in Stuttgart in Germany with the left, uh, left box at the top uh, with Arena 2036. Um, this is a research factory for the automotive industry. Um, based in, in, in Stuttgart and part of the University of Stuttgart, 
uh, where more than 35 partners develop the car manufacturing process of the uh, future. So um, we have a quite strong relationship with them already um, through the last couple of years. And we have just uh, four weeks ago now deployed a private 5G campus network over there. Um, and they will use it, um, of course, for more, I would say, research related, um, research related use cases and testings, like, for example, um, testing low latency applications. They will do positioning technology tests there. And they also have some AGVs um, and communication protocols for AGVs uh, that they want to test uh, in Arena 2036. So this is a real uh, great project where we also, let's say, learn and experience how the use cases can be implemented. Uh, and this is, of course, very important to us to know um, uh, how our technologies fit best into the manufacturing industry. Um, the second one here um, on the right side is our own factory. So um, we as Nokia operate two factories on our own. One is in Olu in Finland. The other one is in Chennai in India. Uh, both of them at the moment, as you can imagine, uh, focus on 5G equipment manufacturing. Um, and we do the new product invention. So the NPI kind of process and approach um, over there. Uh, and on the one hand, this is a factory that is a real one, and we are producing our, our um, SMT and our antenna panels there. But on the other hand, as introduced by Rebecca, um, it also serves as our test bed for the latest 4G, 5G, and IoT technologies. Um, so we have use cases implemented there like, like the automated guided vehicles, like video analytics, like positioning, uh, but also we have a full digital twin there to monitor, visualize, and simulate our shop floor activities um, across the different production lanes we have there. We started already in 2014, um, let's say to digitalize uh, the, the factory with, uh, I would say, multi-year and stepwise approach. Yeah? Uh, and I think the numbers that are significant here, that is that within two years, we basically uh, reached uh, something like 50% of productivity gain by automating uh, parts of the processes and supporting the workers. Um, we had some 22% um, automation increase and automation acceleration there uh, by simply uh, connecting the machines and using additional like AGVs um, to automate, for example, small, small volume uh, logis logistic processes. And we finally uh, increased uh, the innovation and, and the, the uh, con continuous improvement process kind of activities by 27%. So um, for us, that, that is really an, an amazing project. And we are working there, of course, at the moment with 5G uh, to even test the new stuff that is coming around these days. Let me go quickly back in, uh, to Germany for the last couple of seconds. So we also have uh, a, a recent customer that is uh, coming from the discrete manufacturing uh, domain who is producing measurement devices and electronic components. They have selected a quite small area in their production halls um, to test private 5G. Uh, again, uh, they might do some uh, machine retrofitting and some kind of AGV uh, testing over there. They also want to test some gateways and terminals, how they connect to the 5G network. Uh, and this is, I would say, a common approach that we see uh, that proof of concept start quite small, start early in some parts of the plants with two or three use cases. And then basically we take it from there and take the learnings to, to, to uh, make the coverage and make basically private wireless available for the whole plant. And finally, we have a chemical uh, company, also a quite big one in Germany, a uh, similar approach here where they selected a part of their plant uh, or one of their plants um, to, to provide or to put a 5G uh, standalone network over there. Uh, and uh, the use cases in this, in this area are a bit more related to virtual reality, to smart glasses, to human machine interfaces. So a bit more um, what, what, uh, what comes with worker augmentation. But again, uh, we see that they are starting with a proof of concept and that they uh, want to nicely scale up later on uh, to more plants, to more use cases, and even globally to other plants um, over time. So with that, I would like to close here um, and leave you basically with the question how these use cases should be implemented now and which technology is needed to make that happen. And therefore, let me hand over to my colleague, Simon Perry, who will now take uh, the technical part. Simon, stage is yours. Oh, thank you, Thomas. Um, so now that Thomas has, has, has engaged and whetted your appetite as to all the cool things that you can do with private wireless, um, I want to take you through how you actually do that, um, especially uh, in the UK, because uh, the regulator has, has gifted us an opportunity 
um, that very few countries have uh, for deploying private wireless and 5G uh, in enterprise. So if you move on to the next one, the key, you know, this is the recipe, if you like. The recipe, you know, it starts with Spectrum. Um, Spectrum is the most critical resource on the planet. We've all been through all of the fun of retuning our television hundreds of times as, as the Freeview tries to clear, free up Spectrum uh, for use uh, at one end. Um, but the regulator has also been very, very busy clearing out radar and military applications to try and free up um, some higher frequency spectrum uh, that suits that. And um, I'll show you in a minute, but, but the UK is in a, in a unique position um, in, the, in this sense. When you have worked out what piece of spectrum you can use, what you can afford, what, what's the, the right piece of spectrum, you then need some hardware. The radio equipment uh, for mobile networks is customized for each particular frequency band um, and there are rules around emissions and things, which means that we need a lot of different access points for different parts of the band. One of the strengths of Nokia is that we have a huge range of them. As a global company, we have pretty much every frequency uh, available. We also have small ones for indoors, medium sized ones for, for compounds and factories and workyards, and then really big ones um, for use uh, in the public um, mobile network. The other thing Nokia has, has done is that we have observed that the enterprise, the enterprise is a really important uh, market. So we've built uh, a dedicated mobile core for this market. Now, normally a mobile core is 27 racks of equipment designed to handle 20 million subscribers and run 20,000 towers uh, for a country the size of the UK. Funnily enough, that's a very expensive uh, choice. Great if you are one of the mobile operators. But it also comes and it's difficult to manage. You need a, you know, a fleet of PhDs to, to keep the thing running. Fine if you, if you are one of the large mobile operators, not so great if you're an enterprise. So we've rebuilt the core. We have a full 4G, we have a full 5G standalone core that works on a single server. It's downsized that far. And then we've also, you know, some of the, we talked about spectrum, some of these frequencies are a little unusual and there's not so much available. So we are enabling uh, we are bringing, we're working with manufacturers to make sure there's, there are industrial devices, rugged tablets, rugged handsets, as well as modems and dongles and all the other things that you need in an industrial context uh, to connect up your network. So we are trying really hard to do the full end-to-end -end, um, ecosystem that allows you to smoothly and easily deploy a network. Okay, Rebecca? So what do we do? We have a mobile core. And that is, sits right in the middle of the picture that sits on a conventional industrial Dell or HP server. And that does all of the hard work for you. You can then select any of the radios from the Nokia portfolio, big, small, medium size, indoor, outdoor, things that are nice and, and elegant for mounting in an office environment, things that you sort of typically see at the pole in, in, a, in a more conventional mobile deployment. And by putting the core on the site, all of the data stays local so that your data never leaves your premise. Great for security, great for uh, GDPR, great for analytics, great for confidentiality. The other thing that provides you is really low latency. Because the data doesn't have to travel very far, it doesn't have to go through lots of boxes in an entire network. So if you were worried about mobile networks having high latency, this is a way of fixing it. So with 4G, we can get down to 12, 14 milliseconds. With 5G, we can get down to one millisecond um, in the future as 5G evolves. So we can get these very low latencies, which is important for augmented reality. It's important for when we're doing um, the joint work with the robots and anything where, where you need responses on a human scale. Um, it's managed from the Blue Cloud. That's a Nokia data center. Uh, for the UK, we'd use the one in Finland. Um, we can manage it from other places. And that makes it look like a managed Wi-Fi service. It makes it, you know, it, it's got a GUI, you plug things in, you, you manage it um, in a very uh, straightforward fashion intended for your IT group to be able to, to do, do the work themselves. Um, and from that portal, they can manage multiple sites. So if you are fortunate enough to be a manufacturer that has more than one site, you can manage it all for one fleet. And this is all secured with SIM cards. So you can have a SIM card that works on one site, you can have a SIM card that works across all of your sites, but they're your SIM cards dedicated to your network 
and you choose what you do with them. If someone loses one, the device gets stolen, you can go to the cloud portal and, and lock it out. It's really quick, it's really simple, it's really easy to use. And that's really the principle that we've taken with that. And once you have this edge server, there's all kinds of other things you can do with it. Because there's a compute uh, resource on things, we have things like we have an indoor positioning system, uh, we have drones, we have all kinds of voice solutions if you want to replace site radios, if you want to replace pages, if you want to replace all those applications, we have a group of applications that can sit on your edge server and manage them locally. So as well as Thomas, you know, talking, uh, uh, you know, some of the industrial things, there's also all the public safety, your security team can use them. Once you have the network and it's yours, there are all sorts of things that you can put on top of it. So low latency, um, high availability, high security, all the sorts of things that you need in an enterprise network. So I apologize for the next chart, it comes with a warning and things. This is the UK spectrum. Um, the way that this is plotted out uh, is low frequency at the top, high frequency at the bottom, and the colors are for the different mobile operators, Vodafone in red, uh, O2 in, 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 in blue, E in turquoise, three in their corporate purple. And you can see that they all have spent uh, hundreds of millions through to billions of pounds to buy the rights to this spectrum across the UK. This is seriously expensive. There's a chunk top left and a chunk bottom right in white, and that's up for auction. Each chunk within that, the minimum reserve price is 100 million pounds. This is a very expensive game. The UK Treasury is very happy about the sorts of, uh, num I mean, you know, the income that this generates. But Ofcom have taken the decision for the yellow spectrum to offer it to the enterprise market. And it's offered in one location for a very low price. So for the top yellow bits, it's 80 pounds a year. 80 pounds a year, not 100 million. And that gives you uh, the right to use that spectrum. It is yours for that location. So it's shared in the sense that it's, get, it's assigned to indivi individual companies in individual locations. And the two top yellow bits, we use them as 4G spectrum. They're really useful because you can get lots of handsets. If you want to do voiceover, replace pages, replace site radios, those are really good frequencies to do that sort of stuff on. But what Thomas was talking about, where we get very excited, is the yellow block at the bottom. At the moment, no other country is trying this, and the UK has given, been given an opportunity to try and do 5G in a way that no one else is doing it. This is an enormous amount of spectrum. This would be tens of billions if they tried to auction it uh, at a national level, because you can get that much throughput through it. You see 5G, you see people talking about gigabit speeds, this is how you do it. So you can get a license now, it's a little bit more because you're getting big chunks of it. So it's 800 pounds a year per site, okay? But it's still very little money compared to, to what um, uh, the operators are, are being made to pay for national licenses. The compromise is there are power limits. In urban environments, you're gonna be limited to 50, 100 meters with the power limits. In rural environments, you can turn the power up a bit higher and therefore you can get to half to one, maybe to two kilometers. So these are not big distance um, things and that's the compromise that makes it cost effective. So if you're looking to cover a factory, if you're looking to cover a work site, if you're looking to cover a port or an airport or all these sorts of sites, this spectrum is really appealing. If you're looking to try and do national coverage, that's not what it's here for. So, you know, you, you know, use cases, horses for courses, and you can, you know, anybody can apply for this. So if you're a public registered company, you only have to be a registered company to take this. Sorry, not a public registered, you have to be a registered company. So partnerships and other things can apply for it. And you can have up to 100 meg out of the, the, the 400 meg available. So uh, it's cost effective and hence we're seeing, you know, a, 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 you know the combination of the spectrum being made available with Nokia providing a small 4G, 5G core with all the radios being available. The ecosystem is starting to come together through 2020 so that by the end of 2020, we will have 5G SA, the standalone version, the right version of 5G, along with devices to use it, spectrum, radios, the complete things is coming together right now and will be a complete ecosystem by the end of this calendar year which is very exciting. Final thing, what does this look like for these things? Now, you, you know, I mentioned how small it was. 
this is a photo of our system. You can see that the black thing at the front is an industrial server. It's a fanless server, this particular one. We offer various ones, small, medium, large servers, depending on how big a network you want to make. And that, that is where all the intelligence lies. It connects the internet, it connects to your local LAN uh, for, for the data traffic, and then it connects the radio units. The white thing on, on the left is one of our indoor radio units. It's plastic, it looks fairly attractive. You can mount that on a wall of, of your office or your, your factory, and you don't need many of them. One of the really nice things about radio technology, whether it's 4G or 5G, is um, it uses the power uh, much better than competing solutions like Wi-Fi. So our factory in Aulu needs just eight of these to cover an entire factory the size of two football fields about 100 meters square. So a large factory only needs eight of these units. This is not tons of cabling, this is not tons of frequency allocations. You know, there's a lot of really good things about using mobile technology for private wireless. If you try to do this with Wi-Fi, you need six, ten times as many Wi-Fi access points. You'd be sharing the spectrum with everybody else. Um, someone turns up, turns on the personal hotspot on their mobile phone, at which point, you know, your Wi-Fi network suddenly uh, is throughput crashes. This stuff, because you are paying for the license spectrum, not a lot, but you're paying for the license, therefore it's yours, means that, you know, you control everything about it and that you can assure uh, that, you know, your network, everything you do about it will be reliable. You know, we, we deploy a version with two servers. Um, in case one fails, so there's another server to pick it up. And that's generally, we are betting our, our manufacturing plant on this technology. Um, that's how much we, we, we believe in it. So, you know, comes in a cardboard box, small unit, small server, uh, and the various radio units. This is an indoor one. We have bigger ones uh, for outdoor coverage, waterproof, lightning proof, all of those good things. Um, for the North American market, we also have shotgun proof ones. Um, because people, if you put someone on a pole, people do like to, to, to fire, fire their rifles at it. Not so much a problem in the UK. So yeah, so that's, that's the sorts of things that we do um, in order to, to make uh, a private wireless solution easy to consume. We have an opportunity in the UK that Ofcom has, 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 has allowed us to use 5G Spectrum. And the deal is if we find uses for it and we demonstrate to the regulator that as an industry, we are doing good things with it, they will work with us to try and find more spectrum. So if we use it, good things will happen. So on that note, um, I should probably pass you back to Rebecca for, for wrapping up in Q&A. Perfect, thank you Simon, and thank you Thomas as well, that was brilliant. So as we said, we're moving into the, the Q&A part of the webinar now. Um, I've seen a few questions come through, so I'm just gonna, I'll go with Thomas first, um, just so someone can have a break. So we've Look, got a question. Rebecca, we're now looking at a blank screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> can you see it now? Yep. That's cool, yep. Yes, now it's fine. Okay, perfect. Is it going back to a blank screen? Yes, but that's okay. Read, read the questions then. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so Thomas, we've got what are the top three use cases for private wireless uh, and especially 5G and that's compared to 4G in the manufacturing space? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the, the top three use cases, I mean, what we, what we see on the market at the moment are, I would say, different kind of flavors. Um, so let me, let me use those top three as, as let's say, uh, each use case in one in one of those flavors. Um, so we see a lot around these autonomous guided vehicles um, in the manufacturing space, but also in the logistics space, uh, simply because the technology might be already there and is ready. Yeah? Um, we also see, uh, let's say that mobility is one of those key features that also Simon now mentioned, and this, this reliability and mobility uh, that is where private wireless networks are good in. Yeah? Um, so this is why I would say, AGVs and these autonomous vehicles are the ones that we that we see first. Um, second, what we also see is interestingly that uh, use cases are popping up that might not in the beginning require a, a, a private wireless network, like for example, connecting machines or retrofitting any kind of robots. 
And this is simply because um, we see that this machine connectivity is something uh, that usually in a manufacturing environment is known. Yeah, uh, That is something where you have the systems and the devices and the processes and everything in place. And you simply want to, let's say, replace maybe an old technology with a new one to test the capabilities of the new technology. Um, and this is exactly um, why we see a couple of retrofitting machine kind of use cases popping, popping up these days. Yeah? However, let me outline here that, let's say, the retrofitting of a machine is or will not be the, the main or the driving use case for a private wireless, but it is, of course, a very nice and complementary one yeah? um, that, you, that, you, that you can add if you have a multiple set or a bigger set of use cases you want to address. And the final one, and this is of course um, a bit more with the with the newer technologies um, uh, or related to the newer technologies, that is uh, video transmission. And when it comes to augmented or virtual reality, um, so like mentioned before, with the chemical company, uh, we see here a lot of a lot of need for high bandwidth, for low latency, for throughput. Yeah. Uh, so these are use cases we also see now, let's say, popping up as as one of the as one of the first ones. Let me put the opposite yeah, uh, to make it a bit more clearer. Uh, if we talk about cloud robotics, if we talk about, um, let's say, utilizing machine execution system in the cloud or really uh, doing human machine interfaces and all those wireless safety features, um, they are yet, I would say, in the testing phase and in the, in the development phase, but given the technology, Kind of evolution uh, we need still to wait for a couple of couple of more months to have the technology ready to make that happen in a productive environment so just to give you a little bit the, the picture on that one rebecca back to you perfect thank you um question for simon so what is the difference between private wireless with 5g in the uk and wi-fi or wi-fi 6 technologies any suggestions which technology fits best for which use case Okay, fair enough. Um, so, uh, you know, Wi-Fi is brilliant. Wi-Fi is how most of us are actually connecting our laptops and works brilliantly in the home environment. Um, but that's, you know, works great in offices. But actually some of the offices, if you've noticed, are starting to struggle that there's only a limited amount of Wi-Fi spectrum. And the protocol, because it has to share in a very fair way, isn't very good at throughput. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, we, you know, in fact, well, none of us have been to an office. But before we all left the offices, um, you, you do discover that if there were too many people using it, um, it started to really slow down and actually, you know, uh, was quite unpleasant to use. Um, but private wireless is very different. Um, because the base station controls everything, you keep the throughput um, even as you start to load it up you are controlling who gets access to it so you can actually in a much more careful and deliberate fashion traffic engineer it um i was talking to 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 uh the head of a, a, a large automotive manufacturer and he was complaining that every robot that turns up um, in his factory comes with its own wi-fi module that the robots talk to its base station using Wi-Fi, which means you've got to put another Wi-Fi base station in using another access point name, sharing the same spectrum, um, disrupting everything carefully about it. And was, you know, it's apparently a complete nightmare in terms of, of different robots from different um, manufacturers taking very different approaches. So he was very pleased. Um, that by swapping the, 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 the connectivity onto private wireless, you can use one infrastructure securely, safely, reliably for everything, um, which decomplicates everything. So, so don't get me wrong, Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi 6 is great technology. Um, if you're dealing with consumers, if you're dealing um, in, a, in, a, you know, in a public environment, Wi-Fi works brilliantly, but it needs six, ten times as many base stations, um, and uh, it's considerably worse under load. So horses for courses, private wireless is good for some things, Wi-Fi is good for other things. Perfect, thank you. Right, another question for Thomas while we've got time. Um, is there some difference in market trends and challenges across multiple manufacturer, uh, manufacturing sub-industries? Do you experience some different focus or digitization or automation need? Yeah, I mean, 
Um, we see, I mean, as, as, as Nokia, we are, we are currently focusing on, on, I would say, four different um, sub-segments. So we are focusing on automotive, of course. We are having discrete manufacturing, um, which covers um, also, of course, the, the supplier and, and vendor industry of the automotive domain. Uh, but also, let's say, all the others that are producing pieces or any kind of product that you can count in the end. We are focusing on process industries and we are focusing uh, on logistics. So those are the four, the four topics that we see. Um, uh, I mean, in automotive, uh, as mentioned, we see uh, uh, already a very, very, let's say, high, uh, high level of automation. Yeah. Um, and uh, we see, uh, of course, here a very large footprint and, and some scalable solutions and digitalized solutions uh, that come to the market. So we see a, a lot of automation focus here. Um, when we talk about or oh, with discrete manufacturers, um, um, so uh, also the supply industry, we see this kind of lot size one manufacturing and customization as driving topics. So really, uh, let's say making them the production and the manufacturing process more flexible, meeting the meeting the different uh, requirements from the dis different customer groups. Yeah, um, a little bit of automation as well, but um, at least my experience is a bit more that the trend goes towards customization and lot size one manufacturing. And in process industries, um, of course, the environment is a little bit little bit different. So imagine that you don't have a let's say a factory or a shop floor but you have a big plant with huge pipes a lot of metal yeah so different scenarios yeah and we see a lot around this sustainability carbon emission kind of health and safety uh, trends that are that are popping up here not so much about automation and it's more uh, about the connected worker than about the connected machine for example in the process industries compared 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 to others yeah and in logistics, um, I think the example that, that I've shown with the, with the journey is, is one of them where we see that we have small efficiency gains. We start with very, very small optimizations, yeah, but we can then in the end scale it quite big. So it's again a little bit of a different trend that we see, uh, especially as the logistics industry and the, and the suppliers and vendors over there are very, very cost uh, driven yeah, and very, very efficiency driven. So that's why I would say the efficiency part and, and, and getting things faster, even a couple of seconds uh, already helps in millions. Um, uh, that is what we see in the logistics domain. Yeah. Rebecca, back to you for the next one. Perfect, thank you. The questions are rolling in now. Um, so how do you propose to start with a private wireless project and what are the typical steps to get started? Thomas, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I can. Take it. or whoever. Yeah, I can. I can take it um, at least from my view, and maybe maybe others can complement. So, what we see for a starting point um, is to simply uh, out of the. I mean, you have seen a massive number of use cases. I think on my slides, and I guess the the the, the critical task here is to select one, two, maybe three of them to get started. To uh, let's say maybe also select some parts of the manufacturing hall, indoor, outdoor areas to to get some kind of a scope together to get it started to do some proof of concept, yeah, um, because that that is important that you get familiar um, with the new technologies, also with the new processes and with the new kind of organizational uh, stuff that is related um, to such a such a deployment. I think that is that is the first part. Um, we will, of course, as, as Nokia, uh, with partners, we can support you uh, along that whole process, meaning that we really discuss the use cases. We can then discuss the network planning and how all these kind of different antennas, technology spectrum that, that Simon mentioned, uh, all this, let's say, ties together and what is the best kind of choice to make that happen. Um, then we usually deploy this kind of a proof of concept, the small network. Um, and let's say then, and this is an important part, we do the use case integration together, meaning really connecting your machine, connecting a robot, bringing an AGV partner to the table. So really depending on, on, on what the use case is. Yeah? And then we basically have some, some, some uh, uh, go live of the network um, and, and put it into operation. And there are again, a couple of, couple of aspects to either uh, do that from our end or to of course use uh, your own resources or use your partner that you might have in place for network operation already. So, this is a little bit the journey that we that we want to go through uh, uh, with 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 you or with our customers in general. Uh, and I would say the motto or the approach behind it is um, 
to start now because the the, the time is there yeah uh, and the the technology and the capabilities are, are available start small so start with a small setup to gain the experience and then think about how to grow it to grow for additional use cases for additional plants uh, for additional technologies so there is then a, a way forward we can we can help you going through yeah but start start small and then grow big in the end rebecca back to you perfect thank you just conscious of time um so with that, I think I'm going to draw that. There's loads of questions still, so we'll get back to you all individually. There's been loads coming through throughout the whole of the webinar, so thank you for all them as well. Um, what we'll do is, I've put my contact details on here, so if there's any questions um, following this webinar that you've not, or you think of something at a lighter point, um, my email address is on there, and there's a further follow-up email that will come out to you thanking you for joining the webinar today. Um, so just ping any questions, queries, anything over, that's absolutely fine. Um, just like to thank everybody for their time um, this morning and with that I'll hand over to Paul just to close off. Thank you. Thank you Rebecca and uh, firstly I just want to say thank you to Rebecca, Thomas and Simon for uh, presenting today and also uh, I think the UK government for releasing the spectrum and providing uh, for presenting the UK industry with quite a unique opportunity. Um, we will obviously follow up um, as Rebecca said uh, post this uh, uh, the webinar and send out the uh, presentation material, some key material as well from Nokia, and also the answers to the other questions we we haven't had time to uh, to cover. But I just would like to point out that this has been recorded and will be available via uh, our archive page on the uh, NEA website. So feel free to share with any colleagues you think would be interested. And uh, with that, I'd just like to say a final thank you to all for attending. Um, and feel free to follow up either uh, with Rebecca directly or uh, via the NEAA if you do have any further questions. So thank you all. Thank you for a great session. Cheers, Andy. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Really good session, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Really interesting. Thank you.